Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. I thought Gail McGee deserved to be remembered. Uh, he was, a, in many ways, a transitional figure. But McGee was the last Democrat Wyoming elected to the U.S. Senate. Wyoming author Roger McDaniel and his latest book, The Man in the Arena, The Life and Times of United States Senator Gail McGee, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you. And it's our pleasure now to be joined by Roger McDaniel, your second appearance on Wyoming Chronicle, Roger. It is, yes. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Roger, you first came on Wyoming Chronicle to, um, with your first book, right. um, with the late Richard Ager, yes. um, The uh, Suicide of Wyoming's uh, Senator Lester Hunt. And now you've written a new book. Right. Um, on the life and times of uh, Gail McGee, the man in the arena. Why this book? Well, I, I thought Gail McGee deserved to be remembered. Uh, he was, a, in many ways, a transitional figure. Uh, you know, before, uh, McGee was the last Democrat Wyoming elected to the U.S. Senate when he won a third term in 1970, half a century ago. Uh, and then he was defeated in 76. Before McGee, there was never a time in Wyoming history when at least one of our senators wasn't a Democrat, with the exception of the six months after Lester Hunt's suicide when a Republican was appointed to fill in and uh, before Joe Manny was reelected to take that seat. Uh, so Wyoming always before um, figured that it was in the state's interest uh, to have a balanced congressional delegation. But that changed um, in the mid-70s, and uh, as I said, there hasn't been a, well, since Tino was served uh, and retired in 1978 from the U.S. House, there hasn't been a Democrat elected to either House of Congress from Wyoming. This book is meticulously researched. Yes. How long had you been thinking about the book, and how long really did it take you to write it? Well, it took a couple of years to write it. I started thinking about McGee because I, um, I, I ran into people who had no idea who he was. Even uh, in Wyoming? In Wyoming. And I, one uh, woman I asked me what I was working on, I told her I was writing a biography of Gail McGee, and she said, who was she? <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, he, he accomplished a great deal, and he was in the man in the arena, as I, I used that Teddy Roosevelt speech, on issues that were very significant at the time, the, the war in Vietnam, the environmental movement, the civil rights movement. And, um, and we'll get into more of that as, as we talk more about his life. What, um, what has been wonderful for me, and this is a grand read, Roger, for those of us who grew up here in Wyoming, um, it really talks about a time that has passed Wyoming by in yeah. my eyes. Would you yeah. agree with that? Well, and it's a time that, it, it talks about a time that has passed the country by. And throughout the book, you, you see the ability of uh, politicians to discuss very divisive issues and yet remain friends and respect, respectful of one another, have a debate based on facts. And, and maybe negotiate and, some. And, and compromise. And compromise, right. sure. Right. It was a different time, and uh, McGee was a part of that. And um, the end, when the end came, uh, thing, that was the beginning of that change in America. You um, really write well about his campaigns. Let's go back, though, even mm -hmm. farther. This was a school teacher from Nebraska, yes, originally, yeah. who liked to hunt and fish. Yeah, he was, and he, uh, he grew up in uh, Norfolk, Nebraska, small community. Uh, then, uh, after he got his degree, he started teaching at small schools. and uh, he High school to, first, then I, smaller universities. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he was recruited to be the uh, debate coach at Nebraska Wesleyan, whose, whose debate coach had a national reputation. Her teams won national titles routinely. And... She recruited Gail McGee to, to take her place uh, because of his reputation as a public speaker, which, which followed him his, his whole career. Boy, did it ever. Yeah. We'll get into that, too. And he, you know, he taught at Notre Dame uh, later. The University of Chicago. And uh, mm -hmm. he studied at the University of Chicago. He was recruited to come to Laramie after the war because there was this huge influx of, of uh, veterans 
who were using the GI Bill to go to college. And the, and the university, like all universities around the country, had a, had a real struggle trying to find enough room and enough faculty. And, and so uh, a recruiter from Laramie uh, ended up at Notre Dame and found Gail McGee. And he thought he'd be interested in, in coming to the University of Wyoming. And he had a fellow professor there who had been at Laramie and uh, went to him and said, what do you think? Should I take this job in, in Laramie? And the fellow said, no, no, you, you would not like Laramie, Wyoming. And Gail said, why not? And he said, because there's not a decent supper club within 50 miles and there's not a theater within 100 miles. And, and uh, Gail said, well, what do those folks do? And he said, all they do is hunt and fish. So And McGee <laughs> said, I'm, I'm in, I'll, I'll go. And uh, that's what brought him here. And he brought, and it was brought to the University of Wyoming to teach history. Yes. Classes were very popular. Yes. Yeah, his classes were packed. And as I worked on the book, I, I talked to so many people who had either been in his class or had tried to get into his class. And it was filled every semester to the point where the university had to restrict enrollment in the class. People from the community would line up at the in the back of the room and, and peer in to listen to him. And uh, Al Simpson jokes that uh, the only reason he'd get up before 8 o'clock in the morning was for that 8 o'clock history class. <laughs> Who wrote the foreword for the book. He wrote the foreword, yes. Very, very nice. Um, then there was the Red Scare. Yes. At the University of Wyoming, yes. and Gail McGee was in the middle of that. He was, and he was an untenured professor. Of 15 on the panel, he was the only one who was really at yeah, risk. Yeah, took, took great risk, uh, and, it, and it cost him a lot because he, he, uh, uh, he earned some enemies among some of the board of trustees who spent a good deal of the rest of his tenure at Laramie trying to figure and out And let's tell our viewers them. what the Red Scare was. Well, what happened uh, in the height of the Red Scare is that some of the trustees went to a uh, seminar in Ab Ann, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and one of the um, one of the sessions was entitled "The Little Red Schoolhouse Is Redder Than You Think," <laughs> and the uh, the pitch was that university trustees needed to be aware that in their libraries and in their classrooms there were subversive texts being used by liberal professors to teach communist principles. And so the trustees came back quite alarmed at that and passed a resolution to uh, review the textbooks uh, and, and it exploded with criticism. It, we, Laramie was the first university to do that and uh, the criticism was everywhere throughout the country. Uh, people like Arthur Schlesinger and others were writing op-eds criticizing the university for taking that step. And, and McGee joined a group of professors to uh, uh, to fight against it. And eventually the, the trustees figured out that they had made the wrong move and they got out of it by asking Gail McGee and Doc Larson, T.A. Larson, to review some books and report back to them. And they did that and wrote, reported back that they couldn't find any subversive texts and it went away, but it didn't go away for McGee. As a result of that, a couple of the trustees actually hired students to spy on Senate on Professor McGee's classes mm -hmm. to see what he was teaching. And of course they reported back that his classes were very popular and they enjoyed them and they found nothing subversive. Gail McGee, Gail McGee actually became one of the first Americans to go behind the Iron Curtain. He was. Uh, Russia had always intrigued him and um, he, he led the first group of non-government uh, people to go behind the Red Curtain and spent uh, several weeks touring much of uh, the old Soviet Union. And uh, he, he came back and it, during the time of Sputnik and, and the great scare in America that the Russians had beat us into space. And he found that people in Wyoming really wanted to know more about Russia. And he became a very popular speaker in every community he spoke at almost every church in the state and That's civic struck clubs. Me. That's where he spoke often at churches yeah. Yeah. and sometimes wasn't initially welcomed. Right. Uh, you know, there, there, th this idea that he was a little bit pink, maybe too far red, followed him his whole life, although he was uh, the leading spokesman for fighting communism in Southeast Asia. Uh, but uh, there was something about uh, him that uh, caused people to, some people, you know, the John Birch Society had a big place in Wyoming. They did history. not like Gail McGee. They did not like, they didn't like Richard Nixon, mm -hmm. who was the great red hunter of the Congress, uh, but they didn't trust him. And it was that, that sort of attitude uh, prevailed against uh, McGee. Uh, in fact, um, there, his FBI file, which I obtained 
is, is about six inches thick. He made J. Edgar Hoover's list. He, he made J. Edgar Hoover's list, although there, there were people in Wyoming writing to Hoover saying, you need to investigate Gail McGee and making wild claims about, about him. Uh, when the FBI looked at that, they found nothing, and uh, McGee was a big supporter of the FBI. There was always in the back of his mind a desire to run for political office. There was. Yeah. You made the comment that um, no candidate in American history may have been more prepared to run for the U.S. Senate yeah. than Gail McGee. Yeah, I think that's true. And it actually started in 1950. Uh, and uh, McGee had only been in the state uh, about four years. Uh, but uh, the Laramie Boomerang and the Cheyenne newspapers started uh, writing editorials about this young professor at Laramie who was so eloquent and so bright and ought to be running for Congress, and, and he got the itch. Friends from around Wyoming and elsewhere were excited about the prospect and joined the chorus. Letters filled McGee's mailbox. They came from new friends in Wyoming and from old friends on the many campuses where he had either studied or taught. Party activists and fellow professor John Hinckley of Powell urged him to run with a starkly candid but characteristically humorous assessment of what was at stake. Quote, I say, give us a chance to stand and be counted. Hell, you've nothing to lose but your shirt and perhaps a little self-respect, and both can be recovered. <laughs> Beginning in 1950, McGee started looking to the future. Uh, and during those years, he prepared himself not only by traveling the state and getting to know people, but he uh, did an internship at the Council on Foreign Relations, which was very significant because there he was asked to study what would happen to the Soviet Union after Stalin's death. And what he concluded was that uh, <clears throat> China and Russia would not be able to maintain their, their alliance, that while they were both communists, they were different kinds of communists. And, and McGee said, this was in the mid-50s, that China was the most dangerous country on the planet, endangering world peace. Um, and that began to develop his sense that the Chinese would take over Southeast Asia if the United States didn't stop them in, in Vietnam. Uh, and in that process, he got to know people like Eleanor Roosevelt and um, uh, Dean Rusk and Henry Kissinger and so many others, many of whom later would help him in 1958 when he decided to run. And then he did Senate. decide to run and ran, ran against Senator Barrett. Yes. Um, how much, in your view, did um, Barrett's supposedly unethical intervention in the Robertson sale of the ranch um, to e, uh, H.L. Hunt and then the $900,000 tax bill, yeah. how much did that influence the ultimate outcome of that election? Well, when you win an election by less than 2,000 votes, everything you can point at everything as being right. uh, having an impact. But that did have an impact. It uh, was printed in the papers within just a few weeks of the election, uh, denied by uh, former Senator Robertson and, and, uh, and by Barrett. And so... Uh, Drew Pearson ran a second story on election day about it. Uh, I think it, it, it cannot but have been a big uh, difference maker. In the, in, the, in the last few days of the campaign, it all looked pretty close, and something was going to happen to break it loose. And that was one event, and Lyndon Johnson's promise to put McGee on the Appropriations Committee as the first freshman ever right. on that committee also uh, was a big deal in the last week of the campaign. As I was reading through um, your wonderful recount of his campaign, the influence of Wyoming newspapers mm -hmm. was just big yes. um, back yeah. then and, and seems to be very different today. Well, it was. I, you know, you, you think back to those days and, and uh, of course there was no internet. There was no 24-7 news on, on television constantly. Uh, radio, uh, you know, if you missed the, if you're, you're a farmer or rancher and you missed the 6 a.m. news, uh, you didn't know. You didn't hear these things. But newspapers were always there, uh, and they were well-read, and, and the circulation was, was large, and they were very influential. Influential in their opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were. So the, that's changed certainly somewhat today. He won. Yeah. He moved to Washington. You write that it was earth-shakingly emotionally and um, personally yes. um, when, he, when the family made the move. Yeah. Well, you know, the McGee's never had much money. And uh, when he ran uh, uh, that 58 campaign, uh, he had to cash in a small life insurance policy and take a loan from his uh, in-laws um, and, um, and from his parents. And, and so 
and he had to go on uh, a, a leave without pay in June of 1958. So by January of 59, when he gets to Washington, he hasn't had a paycheck for six months. The leave from the university. Right. Sure. And uh, so, um, you know, the, the funny story is he's anxious to see if he can get an advance on his first month's salary. And, and Joel Manny takes him to see the clerk of the Senate and he explains to him the benefits. You get, as a senator, you get free haircuts and there's a doctor available for health care and you get free postage and two trips a year back home. and but no, you can't have an advance on your paycheck. <laughs> he, um, his first speech, um, done earlier than most yes. freshman yes. senators, he was introduced by JFK. Yeah, he was. John Kennedy had been a friend of his from those earlier days at the Council on Foreign Relations. That was a friendship he established then and with Lyndon Johnson. And uh, one of the first campaign contributions that uh, McGee got was from uh, John Kennedy when he personally landed his plane. The, People remember the airplane named after his daughter, the mm -hmm. Caroline, landed at the Laramie Airport, handed uh, Gail McGee five crisp $100 bills, which in <laughs> 1958 was a load of money. But they, they were friends, and uh, when he went to Washington, that friendship continued. Oh boy, did it ever. Um, one of the most fascinating parts of the book for me was JFK's campaign and yeah. Wyoming's role yes. in his um, uh, election to become the Democratic candidate. Yeah, yeah, it's a big piece of Wyoming history. Uh, back in, in those days, uh, they called the roll alphabetically, and so Wyoming was the last to vote. And Both Lyndon Johnson and, uh, and Senator Kennedy thought all along that McGee was with them for a variety of reasons, and McGee- And he would, held it close to the vest, didn't he? He, 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 would, not take a, he would not endorse during, during the campaign. And so it came down to the last state. When, when it got to Wyoming, uh, Kennedy was still short uh, by 11 votes. Wyoming had 15 votes. And uh, only seven were committed to Kennedy. And so the, the, the book tells the story of, of somebody's voice screaming at the Wyoming delegation, give me four more votes. And suddenly Tracy McCracken grabs the microphone and says, all 15 of Wyoming's votes will go to the next president of the United States, John Kennedy. And the crowd burst and the band started playing. And, and it, what's odd is that one of those 15 votes was of uh, Governor Hickey, who had moments later given a seconding nomination for LBJ. So it's, 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 it's kind of maybe those 15 votes got hijacked. <laughs> There's some thought, had he not won on the first ballot, yeah. that he wouldn't have won. Yeah, that, the Kennedy team was convinced, and so was the Johnson team. If they could, Johnson thought if they could get it past that first ballot, that uh, there were enough people who then would not be committed on a second ballot that Johnson, instead of Kennedy, would have been the nominee. Through his tenure in the Senate, he became a tremendous influence to Kennedy, to Johnson, and to Nixon relative to foreign policy issues yeah. of the country. Yeah. This guy from Wyoming. Well, that's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is that Gail McGee always played down his role in foreign policy because his staff said the folks back home won't like that. They, they want to know that you're working on Wyoming issues and not spending a lot of time on foreign policy. And, and he did work on Wyoming issues, uh, but he was heavily involved in so many of the foreign policy decisions. He, that had been his love. And, you know, it was wonderful he, that that uh, the majority leader, Lyndon Johnson, put him on the Appropriations Committee because he could funnel millions of dollars back to Wyoming for water projects and schools and all kinds of public improvements. But he really wanted on the Foreign Relations Committee. And, and uh, LBJ said, look, young man, I think I've given you enough favors. And so he couldn't initially get on the Foreign Relations Committee, though later, later he did, which is a story in itself, particularly around Vietnam. But, but he was involved in uh, issues ranging from the Middle East to the creation of the Peace Corps, the, uh, the Kennedy Initiative in South America, uh, and so much other uh, of, of America's foreign policy. And, and then is probably best known as being the leading uh, congressional proponent for the war in Vietnam. Um, we'll get to that in just a minute. Okay. Also about the boarding of the USS Pueblo. Yes. Um, he played a significant role in urging his colleagues to exercise restraint. Yeah. Um, and when many from Wyoming didn't necessarily agree that exercising restraint was the right, right thing to do. Yeah. 
yeah, he, his, uh, his mailbox was filled with letters uh, from people all over the state urging that he support a military attack on, uh, on North Korea. Uh, and uh, he had, and others were, uh, tried to calm that situation. And it cost Gail McGee a lot of support back in Wyoming. But uh, he gave a uh, speech on that issue on the, on the floor of the Senate at the height of the controversy when the Americans uh, were still being held as hostages. In, for nine in, months was for, or so? For nine mm -hmm. months in, in North Korea and being badly treated. Um, a cause to go to war, but a, but a war was just not the right option. And, and McGee, McGee said, uh, you, you know, you, you, you can start a war these days, but you can't finish it. Uh, given the armaments uh, that are available to, to uh, people like the leaders of North Korea. And, and so uh, he gave this, this really marvelous speech that Robert Byrd called one of the greatest speeches delivered on the floor of the, of the United States Senate. And then there was Vietnam, and he was a supporter for the U yes. United States' involvement in, um, in Vietnam. Again, to the chagrin of many mm -hmm. Wyomingites, especially as the war raged on. You know, in, in the beginning, back before McGee was uh, involved in politics and in the early days of, of teaching, um, he was an isolationist. He voted for Norman Thomas for president. He, took, he attended Charles Lindbergh's America First rallies. He petitioned his draft board to be a conscientious objector and was given conscientious objector status, which... I suspect some of his later political opponents would have liked to have known. Mm -hmm. But uh, then came Pearl Harbor, and uh, that changed everything. And uh, McGee then tried to volunteer. He wanted to be a Navy pilot, but uh, he was teaching a military program at Notre Dame, which rushed young second lieutenants to a bachelor's degree so they could be commissioned and sent to the front. And so Notre Dame would not release him. <clears throat> but his draft board changed his status to 1A. And he was drafted and went for his physical, and that's where he found that he was a diabetic and had diabetes severely enough that he couldn't, couldn't serve. So then he goes to the University of Chicago where he studies international affairs. And, and you can read his, read his scholarly writings during that period of his life, uh, concluding with his dissertation on the question of the Founding Fathers' views about foreign entanglements. And you can watch, it as you read that, him move from being an isolationist to believing that America had no choice but to involve itself, itself in the foreign affairs of the world, that that, because it was our own security which was at stake. And so that's where he developed this sense, uh, what people would later call the domino theory, his, his firm belief that if we didn't stop communism in Vietnam, the Chinese would, would take over all of Southeast Asia. And so that led him to support Kennedy first and, and Johnson later on the war in Vietnam. The epilogue of the book imagines uh, Gail McGee coming back today and seeing what the Senate is like and how different it is technologically, uh, how different it is politically, the polarization that he would not recognize, the amount of money that is involved in running for the Senate. Uh, and um, I conclude the book with, uh, with these sentences. Um, McGee was a college professor at Nebraska Wesleyan where he taught tolerance for Japanese Americans during World War II and at the University of Wyoming where his history classes inspired thousands of young people. He was a United States Senator who taught that the most divisive issues can be discussed honestly and with respect and an ambassador who believed America was strongest when it was serving the hopes of smaller, less advantaged nations. Perhaps Gail McGee's greatest legacy is leaving us with an idea of what we once were, what politicians once were, and how to get back there again. A lot of people talk about civility and his ability to um, have these difficult and harmful, hard discussions, um, and it just doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't, and you know, there was nothing more divisive in our history than the war in Vietnam, and he and uh, he and George McGovern debated Vietnam on <clears throat> 700 college campuses and remained the closest of friends. McGovern came to Laramie to campaign for Gale when he had a, an anti-war opponent in the 1970 election. Uh, and and they, had, they had that ability to, to get along and to respect one another 
on very difficult issues, and we've lost that. And, and before we end, we should talk about his wife Lorraine's yeah. role in his life. Um, at his side, managing his diabetic issues. Yeah. She was a, a full partner from the very beginning. Um, you know, interesting story, her parents didn't like Gail McGee, and uh, they didn't like this young man coming around, and, uh, but, but Lorraine did, and eventually they married, and they had this wonderful partnership throughout their life. She was involved in all ways in his campaigns, and, and later uh, when he was an ambassador, and, um, and, and one, of the, one of her big roles was his health, because he was diabetic, and she could sense uh, the body changing at night while he slept, and that uh, he would be having a diabetic episode. And, 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 and her ability to do that saved his life on, on many, occasions. many occasions. But they were, they were the best of friends, um, uh, you know, not, not just husband and wife, but full partners in life. In my eyes, the man in the arena, the life and times of Senator Gail McGee, for anyone who wants to understand Wyoming's history in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and United States history at that time, and a gentleman from Wyoming's influence, there couldn't be a better research book that tells the story. Well, thank you. He does deserve to be remembered, and, th and those times were significant, and so I, I hope people enjoy the book. Currently, you're the pastor at the Highlands, Highlands Presbyterian Church in Cheyenne. I am. You also continue to write a column for the Wyoming Tribune Eagle and the Laramie Boomerang. Yes, sir. And a committed grandfather and Rockies fan. Oh, all of that, all of the above. <laughs> Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Roger, thank it's been a pleasure visiting with thanks you. Thanks for having me. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you.